everybody, James here, Storytime with Dutch Mantel, episode 95. I don't really know. 95? Well, yeah, he's getting up in, he's getting up to that 100th, 100th episode marker, hey, What are it? we going to do on the 100th episode? All the game shows have a big celebration. Uh, we'll record it naked. <laughs> okay, Cena. <laughs> that's where you got that how's that mustache today james oh you, you were bragging about your mustache before i even had time to give you a compliment about it earlier oh okay but um right. uh, i'm gonna do the very very quick version of the plugs dutch uh because we've got to sort of explain where i am and why this is happening the way it is uh, we're actually going to release this episode a day early by the way so if you're wondering why this has come out on a thursday instead of a friday uh, there's just so much news out there that we want to get ahead of that we thought we'd just do it a, a day early. But we were going to record this on Thursday, right? I was going to be in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. And yep. then, and let me call out the airline, Air Lingus. Oh, I hate Air Lingus. Have you ever actually used them? Or you... Yes, I have. I flew have you really? <laughs> Yes, I, I flew from Dublin from that airport to... I think we flew to Germany on one of our trips over there. W. No, I think that was a, a, T, a TNA TNA tour. No, oh, but they were they were yeah, they're okay. But that's all yeah. I can say. Yeah. Well, well, the first time I flew with them, they only had they'd sent a plane where it only had like the economy seats right but it was like it, it was like for a short haul flight but it was atlantic you know cross atlantic so that was a nightmare and then it was late and everything like that so that was terrible enough as it was but then this time they've just straight up they they even though the plane was on the tarmac and the little shuttle bus was ready to go they just didn't let us go for at least an hour onto the plane by the time we got to dublin to get the transfer to philadelphia the planes had left all of them. So people going to Boston, people going to New York, then, people going to wherever. So yeah, anyway, I'm in Dublin and I have to stay here overnight because uh, of just the uh, incompetence of Air Lingus. So that sort of explains why I'm doing this off a of computer. What are you drink? What are you drinking? Uh, I did have a few calls light because I do I do like my uh, uh, American piss water, but uh, this one I'm having a mixed fruit Copperberg <laughs> cider. What's right that on. called? Coppenklinger. No. <laughs> what's what's the name of that? Copperberg. Oh. It's very nice. So, uh, we'll we'll do the plugs very quickly. So Dutch has got books, I've got books, but let's focus on Dutch's stuff. Go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com to get your signed books, your signed diplomas, your signed uh hats, I believe, as well. We're also on Pro Wrestling Tees. And I can't remember what else we do. But this one's gonna be some news Dutch. And you're going to be taking the lead on this first story. So you sent me an email recently, something yep. revealing about John Cena. And uh, someone reliable has uh, told you some stuff. So let's have it. W what's been said? Okay. You remember <clears throat> back, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three weeks ago, I think, Cena was asked about his opinion of Vince. And he was so gracious and saying, hey, he brought me to the dance or whatever, so I'm going to be, basically, he, it, was, it was a love, it was a love message that he loved Vince because, and true, to tell the truth, he made John Cena a lot of money, a lot of money. So, so. So I was on one of my infrequent calls today to one of my brethren in this lovely profession of pro wrestling. And he was telling me a story and I, I brought that up. And the guy says, you know why, don't you? I says, you know, I do a podcast, so I should know all this stuff, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> I says, oh, yeah, I don't know about it. But I said, I bet you don't know this. So I said, okay. He's telling a story about Vince when TKO and Endeavor took over WWE. They knew several weeks or months in advance that Vince was in trouble. 
So I think Harry Manuel and Nick Khan huddled and said, let's just get the de deal done with Vince. Let's get him out of his position. And then when it's all, when we have control, then we'll, we'll get rid of Vince. But Vince didn't know that. So they got all mad at each other and, you know, they would do a couple of interviews together and they were so buddy, buddy. And I'm thinking, you know, this looks a little odd too. I didn't know what to think of it, but what had happened is that Vince, after they ran him off, he got pissed off. And this happened, I think he was, and they were, they had different reasons to be pissed off at him, but about, I think six months prior to him leaving, he worked a deal with John Cena and sent him to NXT for about, I don't know, a month, two months. Yeah, John Cena was uh, doing a SmackDown run for about nine weeks, and he also made some appear an, an appearance with okay. NXT in a Saudi Arabia show, a couple of pay-per-views, that kind of thing. Yeah, so John John Cena agreed to it, and when he was doing his talk about Vince, it was like, hey, like I said, it's like a, a, a love message. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay true to the one who brought me to the dance, and I think, wow, you know, nothing about what he did or anything. It just sounded completely out of uh, out of whack. But I I heard he paid Cena or WWE paid Cena an obscene amount of money, obscene amount of money. So, but guess who didn't know about how much money they were paying him? Oh, TKO. Mm. Then they found out how much money they had paid Cena. Then they got pissed at him. So now when it's all going down, Vince is, I think Vince is, he is banned. He is barred from even going into the WWE headquarters in Stanford. He can't even go in there. And they are actively, and I also heard that they are act, actively working with the FBI. So... And remember, we talked a while back, said, is this story, what is, what is some of the other things that's going on? And we don't know. But I heard this today, whether it's true or whether it's not, it's still a good little story to, uh, to start off the podcast mm. because I, I, I love, I love, it's called stooging. <laughs> you tell everything you know, and then when somebody said, "Oh, that's not true," you know that's not true. Well, you know, but I heard it, so I just thought I would share what I heard. So, take take from that story what you will. And my main thing is, you know, when I heard Cena talking so glowingly about Vince, and we even brought it up on the show. He said, "Wait a minute," he did. He didn't even say. Well, if he's guilty, he needs to he needs to go to jail. He, he didn't even say that. And now we know that he gave him a lot of money, so he just keep his mouth shut. Would you? Uh, I mean, did anyone take a stab at how much money Cena was paid, or was it hints? I heard or? it was in the millions. Yeah. The yeah, so did multiple you, millions. Did you hear any? Worth. You hear anything like that? Um, no, I've never heard any anything of this story. This is something that you uh, you you were uh, sleuthed out today. Hey, the information was just given to me without me asking. They were saying, "Hey, I give you a little a little heads up here." So, if it's true, and eventually we'll find out if there's any truth to it at all. But this tells me that TKO and Endeavor, they hate Vince now. They literally hate him. So. There's, uh, well, we're going to be talking a lot about 
the news, as we uh, always do on these podcasts these days, the main event's going to be CM Punk. And when I, I sent you the script before, and he went, geez, that was a long script. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But just basic notes, uh, you know, that we're going to be uh, getting through the CM Punk interview that was an hour and 50 odd minutes as well. I actually stayed up to like half one in the morning watching it because it dropped quite late, or, you know, I found it quite late. Uh, but we'll be talking about that in the main event of this show. But this time, uh, this next story we're going to be talking about is AEW releases. So this is the first mass layoff, I think, that Tony Khan has ever done. I'm going to give you the names mm -hmm. if you want to know more about any of these names. But for crime and his sake, apart from Dasher, I, I barely, and a couple of the names, I, I wouldn't recognize him if I was in a phone booth with him. Uh, Dasher Gonzalez, she let was... Me, let uh, me ask you something. Yes. Tony Khan has Ring of Honor. Yes. What are those ratings? Anything? They, they can be measured on, I mean, if you've got your socks off, you can measure them on your fingers and toes. You're, you're talking about 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 a week because it's exclusive to the what, Honor Club. What station or network are they on? It's like the WWE Network, but it's a Ring of Honor, Honor Club network. But so there's absolutely. only like 10, 20,000 people sign up to it. So is it like, a, it, it's a paid service you pay for it? Yes, that very few people pay for. So no, essentially nobody watches it. Infinitesimally small. To put it this Hell way, not, our, our even, ratings dominate <laughs> Ring of Honor. Does, does, does Meltzer take it? I don't even take think he takes it. No, I don't think he reviews it. I think he, I think he probably has someone to uh, review it for him. But no, the, the the point is that no one watches Ring of Honor, and I think quite a lot of these guys probably, as, as you're suggesting, have been on Ring of Honor or just not on at all. So there's the boys, primarily recognised as Dalton Castle's valets, Jose the mm -hmm. assistant who joined the promotion in 2021. Basically, almost none of these people have been on for ages. Jara Joel, jo who? Anthony Henry, <laughs> don't know. Gravity. No. We we watched a match with Gravity, and it was uh, that impossible botch fest where he messes up every single move. That was hilarious. They should have kept him on just for the comedy. Uh, Stu Grayson, uh, he initially departed from AEW in 2022, returned the following year, Ring of Honor, as you say. Uh, Parker Baudreau, barely been on. Slim J, barely been on Ring of Honor as well. So... 10 releases. The only one that's surprising is Dasha because she was actually a uh, a ring announcer and backstage yeah. interviewer, and she was being used. So she's the only surprise, as a, and she's the only person who's been used who's been gotten rid of. Well, we'll get to the, the, the punk interview in a minute, but we've often said that I don't know why he signs up so many people, and they were all getting paid. Oh, yeah. He would sign them for three years and he would tell them, if I sign you for a three year deal, you're going to get paid for three years. That's what he was telling them. Yeah. So I wonder going forward, is that little tenant he put out, is it still in effect? Hell, no wonder people were dying to go over there because you didn't work. You work TV on Wednesday and Friday, maybe, and did the pay-per-views. But most of these guys, I don't know. They just, they got paid for just, they would go to TV and sit around and talk to each other. Yeah. That's like, even even they would... if they went to TV. I mean, some of these people haven't been seen in six months or a year on TV. They've just been left off completely. They are the witness protection. Hmm. Weird. Very, very weird. So, uh, um, with, with Tony Khan, as you said, you know, uh, he was telling these guys, look, if I sign you to three years, you will get paid for three years. Now, it's funny how in a year where the TV rights have been negotiated, that that word has been gone back on. And to be honest, uh, Tony Khan should be praised for this, really, because someone's got to him to the point where they've said, you're paying money for nothing, you're not a charity. Well, you would think somebody that that you're going to pay 
you're going to put to work doing something. But a lot of them would see this is what would he pick up hotel rooms too? Um, yeah, I think so. But yeah, I think so. Yeah. He would pick up the flight, probably the cab into the building or into the hotel and then pick up the hotel and flight and the food. That was quite expensive. That was costing him. If he did 50 people that way, I bet it's costing him, I don't know, 70 grand, to, um, maybe 80 grand to, uh, every time they do a TV. If you fly them in and put them mm -hmm. up, you know, they didn't, they didn't stay at motel six. They stayed at the Marriott's and they stayed at, you know, the, the nice hotels that, you know, about two fifty three hundred dollars $300 a night. So multiply that by 50 guys and that's what you got. But I will, I will say, I respect that if he said that he followed through with it he didn't break it, he didn't change it. So, and I also heard through my source that Mr. Khan was uh, was going to have some more releases coming up because oh, really? we all kind of knew that. That's not that's not even news. That was ten he got rid of. I think ten is coming up in the next next week or so. That's logical because we would have. I, I assume that anyway. Once they start, they keep going to they they cut all the the dead wood out. So. We'll see where this goes. Uh, I wonder who's what whispering in Tony's ear. Who do you think's whispering in his ear and telling him to make cuts and make the company more attractive and, you know, uh, less of a money loser? Well, he was told this a long time ago. We've even told him on this podcast. I'm sure he doesn't listen to it, but maybe he does. But he needs to, and I've said this a thousand times, he needs to start being a boss. You cannot be a booker and pal around with the boys because they will get on your good side and tell you, uh, they'll tell you everything you want to hear. They'll tell you how great you are and what about this idea. And, and he likes that. He wants to be accepted like every other human being on this earth. But this is that a... with you. Who did that with you when you were a booker? Did you notice any wrestlers overly trying to pal around with you in order to oh, get yeah. a more interest from you? Yeah, but I was in a I, I was in a different league. <laughs> <laughs> Tony's a billionaire. I'm a hundred air. <laughs> but yeah, they 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 are. People would do that. Well, it's natural anyway. But but I tried to use I tried to use everybody, and I just didn't put people out there just to, just to put them out there. You know, I read I read an interesting thing about Paul Heyman. He was talking about the bloodline, and said this has gone about. We know it's gone three years. I think he he was saying that it, it went four years. And he's trying to say that when he booked, and I heard this a long time ago too, when you start an angle, and I was said it's not the first step that's so important, it's the second step in getting that angle going. That's what's going to propel it forward. Then you keep adding to it as needed, but, and you need to say, uh, you need to know how long this angle is going to go. Now, Paul was trying to say he knew how it was going to end and how long it was going to go. I got to throw the flag on that because he may have known how long it's, uh, I mean, uh, how it was going to end. But to go four years, nobody's going to book that far in advance. Because nobody can foresee anything going four years. Yeah, you couldn't have foreseen Solo Sokoa. You couldn't have foreseen Sami Zayn. You couldn't have foreseen The Rock returning. Uh, I, I mean, Paul Heyman especially was very good at rolling with the punches and working with what he had. Well, good. I, I mean, well, he, 
See, I've known Paul for years and years and years. I knew him when he had the ECW and and he rolled with the punches there. I think a lot of times, I don't know if he knew everything that went on in that company. Because I think most of those ECW guys, they was all <laughs> they was all half drunk, half doped up half the time doing those shows. And he just he did, he just ran with it because that was the crowd he was appealing to. You know, and he could go out and check the temperature in the room and you know. Those Philadelphia fans are crazy anyway. So they would go out there and they'd listen to the they'd listen to the crowd and guys would just do crazy stuff, especially Sandman. Sandman, he would just I don't think he knows a, a headlock from a wristwatch. He don't and he don't care. The people don't care. He would just take that damn kendo stick out there and just beat the crap out of everybody. And one of the Harris boys told me one time they threatened to kill <laughs> Sandman because they knew he was going to run into the, the ring at some point, but they didn't know when. And then when he ran in, they didn't expect him coming. And I think Donnie, Donnie uh, told me, uh, Don, Don Harris, he said Sandman hit him so hard with that kendo stick. He said he had never been hit that hard in a fight. And then here come Ronnie to kind <clears> of <throat> help out his brother, and he hit Ronnie hard. You know, these, these are two big brothers if they get a little hot at you. And they started, and they told me the story, they started beating his ass, and they beat him back all the way to the dressing room and then went in there. And of course he run to Paul. What the hell is going on with these guys? You need to fire him. You need to do this. And they walked in there and they said, Hey, you need to watch that mouth. Cause that, that ass kicking can continue a little more or so. And then he, <laughs> then he kind of, he kind of shut up. And then Paul, he went like this. He went, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know what you want me to do about it, but, but it, I will have love. Gone. Yeah, I would have loved to have been there that night. But anyway, back back to back to Paul Heyman. You know, I think he has to be fantastically amused by how long this bloodline angle has gone. Because right after WrestleMania last year, when Cody didn't beat him, the interest went like this. It went, you could feel it. Now the th thought is, how do they get it back up? Well, you get it back up, but not by hot shotting it, but just go with the stuff that got you to where you were. Uh, because you mentioned ECW, right? Because it's actually what I've got next that I want to talk to you about. And this is something that we didn't touch on last week. We were talking about the Rock and Cody Rhodes. And, you know, the the big beating, uh, we're going to talk about the Attitude Era and Triple H talking about it in a minute, but Blading versus Hardway, right? And yep. there was, for many years, WWE either banned blood from 2008 onwards, uh, I think weirdly coinciding with PG and Linda McMahon running for Senate or whatever she was doing. And then, you know, they wanted to make WWE PG and there was no more blood. And then anytime there was ever any blood, Doctor run in, stop the match, wipe the blood away, and it just wasn't practical, really, for a, a physical pursuit such as pro wrestling. But then, the couple of times that they actually planned on doing blood, they wanted to do it hard way, and I think the most famous example is Brock Lesnar elbowing Randy Orton half to death uh, to, to get blood, and it was like, how come that's not barbaric, yet just a little like that is? And now 15 years has gone by, and now it yep. makes sense to have, you know, a properly prepared, sanitized blade to create blood, which is far better than getting concussed. I have no idea. Hey, I've been with some guys. Some guys are known as as just juicers. I mean, they Abdul the Butcher. That's all he does. Bruiser Brody. 
All he does, not so much Hanson, but Brody. Because I think they kind of, they kind of enjoyed that, that self-mutilation. And you could look at their head and you you could say, oh, I see I-4. Yeah, I see I-75 branching off. It's like a map looking at it. You could get, you could find out how to get to Chicago by following that map. But, but when they stopped blood, and I'm not a big fan of it myself. I hate it. So, but I think, I don't know, is the business changed. And I think uh, a lot of people didn't like it. I think they were talking about, well, the guys didn't like it because I, I think you you need blood every now and then because I think that shows the intensity of a rivalry and it can it can it can work to stimulate people, even stopping the match. But hell, they act like you get a nosebleed. Oh, we got to stop it. We got to stop it. I mean, they had, but that was under the old regime. Now I think, didn't the Rock make a statement about what's going on now? Or are we gonna get to that later? Uh, I don't have anything about the Rock. In this, well, in this one. he said something. Triple H said well, something. I, I, yeah, Triple H said it. And he says we're in the the middle of the Attitude Era 2. I said that two weeks ago. You did? I said Attitude Era 2.0 is what I said. Let me, let me give you the quote. Let me give you the quote. So, uh, sorry to interrupt. Triple H said, as we roll into this, the business is probably, I can look at it different now, like where I just said a minute ago, we didn't know it was the Attitude Era at the time. Having lived, uh, lived through that, I can look at that right now and say we're in another era like that. People won't put a tag on it, like we didn't call it the Attitude Era in the Attitude Era. They'll put on a tag on it later or whatever it is. But if we can maintain, we're in that same white hot level of everything sold out. Everything we're doing is just clicking. And you see it's Travis Scott wanting to come in. You see it with Bad Bunny wrestling with us. You see it with The Rock coming back. Rock's got a busy schedule. If wrestling's on the down, he ain't coming in. So you see that. You see the excitement. WrestleMania 40 will be massive and we're going to do everything we can to make it the biggest WrestleMania in history. So he's he's not so so much saying it's attitude era 2.0 as far as aggression and blood and big silicone boobies everywhere, but he's saying more maybe the intensity, but definitely the popularity and ticket sales. He's sort of comparing the attitude era. Did you point. see when The Rock and Roman were whipping uh, Cody and Seth with those belts? I did. Brother, they, they was whipping some asses big time. I mean, those belts are pretty heavy and they're wide and they hurt. And they were lacing the, the, the crap out of them because the rock, by him being in Hollywood, you know, when you're looking at a movie, and you see something, and they do something that's not believable, it blows it completely out of the, the realm of believability. So they went out there, and I'm sure they told Cody, and they told Seth, we're going to lay it in. But, you know, and what are they going to say? But they don't care. They said, lay it in. Because the money they're making, hell, I'd take an ass whooping. If you're going to pay me like, I don't know, $5 million a year, yeah, so, sort of whip my ass every now and then. <laughs> Keep me in line. Hey. <laughs> but that's exactly what I like to see that WWE is doing with the Gunther, same deal, laying those chops in, the, the, the same thing. But now the whole, it seems like to me, the whole uh, roster is enthusiastic about the path they're taking. See, with Vince, their Vince was a cancer that really needed to be removed. And I'm not going to really, I, I think what he done is horrible, it's horrific. But 
He should he, he should have been gone before then anyway. Before yeah. all this came out, he should have been gone five, six years ago. So he, he definitely got creatively bankrupt. Well, no matter how great an idea of one of the creative staff has, or even one of the guys, if you tell it to somebody and immediately after telling him, he just said, I don't like it. And, you know, I, I think you could have had the damnedest idea in the world and give it to Vince. He's in a bad mood or he's pissed off about something else. And he don't like it, and it, it just goes out the door. He never brings it up again. Even if you bring it up to one of the creative guys, you know what they say? And I don't want to bring it up because now Vince didn't like it the first time. So if they bring your idea up, you know, they're going to be on the chopping block. So, but Vince, and I've said this before, Vince was... He was a bad influence, even though he was the owner. He, he was a bad influence on, on, on that company, especially on the creative end. So, but anyway, back to what Paul Heyman said. He says, uh, when you, you book an angle, you need to know how it's going to end. Yeah, I, I agree. Actually, one booker told me one time, he says, if you want to do an angle, go all the way to the end and book in reverse which kind of makes sense. And then finally you'll get to the point, you, you'll go so far in the start, and then when you come from the other end, then it meets. It's, it's hard to explain and understand, but I've known several bookers who did that because that's the way they were taught. So, see, when I was in TNA, they would just book from pay-per-view to pay-per-view. Then it was like, dump everything and let's let's start it again now you're trying to rebuild it in three weeks or four weeks and then after you did that pay-per-view you dumped it again so we never had a consistent line of heat like the bloodline has and and they proved to me yes you can have you can have a long drawn out story See, I was hearing guys talk last year. Oh, they didn't. They didn't put it on Cody at uh, at at Summer uh, at WrestleMania last year. Was it WrestleMania that Cody wrestled him? Yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah. In uh, Inglewood, because we would because you yeah, asked uh, off air about Austin Theory, didn't and, you? So it was that. And and people, oh, they're oh they're so pissed off. Oh, we invested in this, and you didn't. You didn't give it to him and you didn't let him have it. And but look at the money they have made out of this. And it's been a pretty damn interesting story. And those guys, I don't know if they act like heels on the street. I don't know. But but the people, I think, I think they're the heels that are over so much they could turn on baby face just like that. Not all of them, because they don't have any opponents. But one of them branching off, like Jimmy did. Didn't Jimmy? Wasn't he the one who broke off? Jimmy? Yeah, I think so. I can, yeah, but he got. It's been years. I can never tell the difference between them. Oh, I can't either. I, I get. I, I get them confused. So. I, uh, I I'm going to go completely off tact, uh, off off piece here because I briefly want to mention we're going to AEW then we're going to come back to Vince McMahon but Matt Cardona made a surprise return to AEW mm -hmm. I think it was just a one off surprise one shot uh, versus Adam Copeland he answered the uh, uh, the Copen or whatever he was calling it open whatever for his uh, title they've got history together from the WWE from many years earlier but it's a straight question what do you think of Matt Cardona because you were in WWE with him at the time and he's made a big success out of himself as an independent wrestler well, I thought he had talent, but they never used him. Never used him. He would sit in the dressing room and and we just look at each other. <clears throat> but he had a lot of talent. And he was doing, I think he was doing stuff on social media. 
something like that. And actually his social media stuff was good. It was interesting as hell. And I'm thinking, why doesn't Vince see this? Why don't they do something with this guy? Because I'm sure that he was better than some of them they were trying to use. He was interesting as a young guy, but I don't guess Vince ever saw it in him. And if Vince don't see it, you don't get it. So he finally, and he was there a long time. How long was he there? Ooh. 10 years? Yeah, 10 years, a dozen years or something like that. Yeah. And I, well, think, something, he won, I something think he won a kept belt him there. for like a day. And then he won another belt for a day. And that was it, basically. He just mm -hmm. and, and then he um, Hugh Jackman, he tagged with once, which yeah. was a big deal, you know, a big deal to him, I'm sure. But that's pretty much it. You know, he was always on the losing end or he was always on the lower card and he looked great, had a great look. And mm -hmm. and um, as you say, he was a talented guy. That, so he was just suspecting that it's just one of those people that Vince just never saw anything in, wrote him off immediately. You know, you can look at him and he's very creative and he's, I, I, you watch him in the ring now. He connects with those people. That's not something you can teach. You can't teach that in a wrestling school. You either you either touch them or you don't touch them. That comes from the individual. It doesn't take a lot of talent to do it either. It's something that happens. And they liked him. And he was he was good in the ring. And I that's why I say Vince actually, I think, did more harm than, than he did good, especially with the females. But we're not we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, Cardona, he was a uh, he. He was very good, and I think he's coming back to WWE. Yeah, I think so. His girlfriend, his his wife, Chelsea 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 Green, she's there now, correct? Oh yeah. So I think, uh, and I, I think he probably gets along. With Triple H, Triple Triple H is more a type guy that they can go and talk to. He's like an advisor, a mentor. He listens. See, to when the they fans. went to talk, he listens to the fans because you saw with Cody and The Rock and everything. As soon as that went pear shaped, yeah, you know they 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 completely changed their storylines to make it make sense for everybody. So they realized they'd done wrong Vince, and then corrected course. Vince would have never done that. He said, no, we're going this. It's laid out. By God, we're going to do it. But you got, I've said this a thousand times, you got to check the temperature in the room. They didn't like, they didn't like the rock jumping Cody. I mean, jumping in line. And then Cody, they knew something was up when Cody walked off. And everybody in that building said, uh-huh, okay. What the hell happened here? And they were reading about The Rock. All of a sudden, he's ahead of the board, the TKO board, and and he's the big. He's got power over all of them. I mean, underneath the area of Manuel and maybe uh, the Nick Khan, he he's that he's that high. So what he says goes. But I think it is better for Cody to go against Roman. And now last week we kind of give our thoughts on how we think that match is going to go. Right. We did still, still think it's going to go that way. There's nothing that's made me think otherwise. No, no. And I think it'd be a great match. I think they'll give them time enough. Hell time on WrestleMania. They didn't, they didn't even think about that anymore. Hell, it's one o'clock in the morning. Hell keep going. Hell. Who gives a crap? Used to be three hours. If you weren't off in three hours, guess what? You went to black. Mm -hmm. You didn't have your finish in. You better got it in before that thing went off because they they were gone. They they would take off. We're gonna do. We're not gonna do a WrestleMania special because uh, I talked about this with you last week and I said, Dutch, will you watch all the WrestleMania? And you went, No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> That's that's almost like having a job. I know. When you've watched... I, you get paid. I, I, well, yeah, I do, but... Okay, well, what are you willing to watch then? Because I know you're willing to watch something. So I'm going to watch... The main events. 
Uh, yeah, I'm gonna watch Cody and Roman. I'm gonna watch that. Mm. And no, and I'll watch the tag match leading up to it. See, this is what it's like. See, they're putting all this together. This is like a major, major movie that's being made. They're in Philadelphia all week. They got a ring set up. And they're working on this match every day. So when they get there, they're going to know exactly what's going on. And actually the the cues, were, they need to be here, then, when, what. So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing how they do this. And I'm very interested in seeing those Philadelphia fans, because they're noted for being just sometimes obscene. Mm -hmm. they, they're crazy fans in Philadelphia. I don't know why, but even when I was with uh, WCW, and we would run that building downtown. Oh, the fans were just nuts. It's crazy. And I could I could detect even back in those days that the business had gotten gotten away from its roots. Because you know, when you usually go in your car to leave, they would usually be about 60% females waiting for you. Back in those days, though, with WCW, we would go out in the like a little parking area. It's like a little street they set aside for you. They were it was like ten percent girls and ninety percent guys. I said, "What the hell?" <laughs> so I knew that it had changed right then, <clears throat> because when you run the women off, and the women are no longer coming, something's up. Something's up. So are we going to talk about the letter that we are going to talk about it right now? In fact, Janelle oh, good. I was, I, I was getting ready to that. So a love letter written by Janelle Grant, and it is, has been written by Janelle Grant to Vince McMahon shortly before he broke off the relationship has surfaced unsurprisingly from Vince McMahon's lawyers. And here's a fun note for everybody. Vince McMahon's lawyers are the same legal firm that <laughs> caught Bauer of MLW used to successfully negotiate a $20 million settlement out of WWE. So Vince has obviously thought, man, they were good enough to beat me. If you can't beat them, join them kind of thing. So anyway, I'm not going to read the letter because it's it's mostly cobbled together from other sources, including films and celebrity quotes. And Janelle, uh, I believe, started the letter off with, this is the 24th draft. Uh, the New York Post has a letter in its entirety. Uh, so if everybody wants to Read it there. It's 2,200 words or something. But anyway, uh, Grant's attorney, Ann Callis, told the Post that McMahon actually instructed Grant to write the notes. Quote, frankly, it's pretty disgusting that Vince's week late, uh, weeks late attempt to defend his horrendous behavior, behavior he, he claims to this day never happened, is to try to showcase letters that Vince himself coerced her to write, Callis said. His psychological torture of her continues as a typical of abusive predators who respond to women speaking out with increased threats. While Janelle isn't a stranger to his intimidation tactics, this is a new low even for him. So <laughs> interesting. This is interesting because in oh. a sense, it doesn't prove anything one way or the other. The, the, here's the other odd fact I'll just leave with you. Another uh, Grant had recently had surgery on her finger and she text, I, she may have texted her friend this saying, uh, and took about a picture her of it, didn't she? Yeah, she took a photo of it. I couldn't find the website where that was on. But anyway, uh, she said uh, to Vince, actually, I'm so sorry if I mess this up. I want you to have a nice letter. The letter's existence can be spun either way. So it's, it's a bit of a stalemate st story, depending on who you believe, I guess. Well. Did you read it? I did read the letter. Did you really? Yeah, I read it all. No. Oh, what were some highlight oh, passages it was just it, it was just, oh, she was just... Uh, glowing over Vince and how handsome he was and how she she's so lucky to be in his presence and he is so smart and he's taught her this and he's taught her that and he's a not he's he's not only a father figure he's a lover he's this that you know if a woman wrote me a letter like that I would say you need to hit 
the friggin' road right three now. Years. After three years, three years relationship as well as like you hate each other after three years. You just sort of just get on with it. Oh, uh, and I, but see, Vince liked it. I don't think she would have written. I think she, I, I've seen a picture of her. She looks like a really mousy girl. She's not a bad looking girl, but I think she's a, the mousy type. Demure. <laughs> well, maybe I, I wouldn't be that flattering with it, but Vince found her and he found her. And this is what the, the attorneys, her attorneys would bring out. He found her at a time when she was at her lowest. Her parents had died. She had nowhere to live. She didn't have a job. And so Vince says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to groom this, this young woman. And he, he groomed the hell out of her because he didn't start having sex with her right off the bat. Did he? No, he, uh, he sort of, uh, <laughs> mentored you know, her into it. Ment yeah. Mentored her and then answered the door one time with his shirt off in his underpants, I guess. And, you know, you sort of like, you know, start with the hugging and the hand holding and then you move on. Well, it, they it's, move on to shitting on the head, apparently. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's weird reading this stuff. And who who brought this letter out? Vince's attorneys. Yeah. They brought it out. Yes, to besmirch the uh, character. Of Janelle Grant, when you when you read it, did it read like something? And now you know everything around it. Does it read like something that Janelle Grant had come up with herself, or do you believe it was coerced? Wait a minute, nobody said she was damn uh, Hemingway that she was that good. Yeah, she stole a line here, a line there. People that know that can tell you where this is. That line is from, or or this couple of taken from a paragraph somewhere and but Vince he don't read that crap he don't even know what it is he she just had to write it down hell that's worth that's worth about ten thousand dollars writing him a damn letter right there don't you got to tell him all the stuff that he now I'm I'm saying this is what I think that he wanted to hear so he was Vince is a weird duck. Not only was he a weird duck in the wrestling business, he was a weird duck outside the wrestling business. So I, I want this to I'm gonna pay close attention to this, as will everybody. And I I'm, I'm gonna be very honest with you. I've missed the hell out of it. When they went dark for like a month, and I went, wait a minute. They're you not going to end week. this. You said that huh? last week. It's like we need to. We just need some. Yeah, Vince we need to, to spice it up. And here it, here it right. comes. Right, right. We need to damn. We need to get some juicy stuff. But if I had a woman hand me a letter like that. I'd say, "Hey, uh, would you? Did I leave my? Did I leave my coke in there? Would you go and see? If, I'd be gone. And then my my phone." No, it'd be blocked. Hey, I did. I just cut it off. But I mean, even if I was single, because well, Vince had control over her. I didn't. I I I never would go that far. But see, I, I'm looking at this like from an outsider. But. Let's go to Laura Nitus now. <laughs> I like that he said he was coerced. He was pressured into having sex with her. Mm. And I'm thinking, John, I don't know where you got this attorney. <laughs> He's trying to turn state's evidence and trying to see and when he talks to the FBI, he will stooge out everything he knows about Vince. And since we're talking about the high echelon in WWE, what's the latest on Bruce Pritchard? 
Well, um, let me just find this. Right. So with Bruce, I believe he's I don't know if he's back. I know he took some time off for a surgery. And on his podcast, he basically spanned the line of, hey, it's a legal situation. I can't comment. But Bruce's name has been in the uh, wrestling news again recently because of Ronda Rousey. Now, Ronda Rousey's got a book out. I forget what it's called. And she's made a few interviews where she just goes all in on burying WWE and everyone associated with it as much as she can. So we'll get to the other thing she said in a minute, but that's sort of a push in a sense. But anyway, she's talked about Bruce Pritchard again. Now, uh, this is the quote. Supposedly, Vince is out now because of all the sexual assault stuff that has come out. He's still running it through all his little cronies. WWE needs to completely clean house. This guy, Bruce Pritchard, I've never heard of him. Say, uh, I've never heard him say a single one of his own opinions. It's just Vince this, Vince that. Supposedly, McMahon is gone now, but I wouldn't be going back to work with them anytime soon because the last time he was gone, he was still running the show. Hopefully, he's completely gone and they are running more responsibly and allowing people to rehearse. Okay. For whatever reason, I copy and pasted that and read it. I hadn't seen that last bit there. So she's upset with not allowing... Apparently, Vince wouldn't let people rehearse. Well, I think he cut down a lot on it, but we used to get in the ring, and he would get in the ring, too. And he would... With the agent. And they would go over what was going to go down, what was going to happen here, there, what was going on. And he'd be in the ring sometimes too. I don't know what Rhonda is referring to there, but I guess he didn't want her to do it. I don't know. So, Maybe but, because he got injured, I don't know. Well, let's leave out the rehearsal thing for now then. Bruce Pritchard, uh, how much crossover, apart from in the mid-90s when he worked for the WWF, how much crossover have you had with Bruce over the years? A uh, pretty good bit. Yeah. Is it a is that a fair assessment that Bruce Pritchard's a guy with no opinions? He's just a he's just an avatar. He's just a, a mouthpiece for the boss. Well, he looked for that because when he had to tell somebody some bad news, wasn't coming from him. It was coming from somebody above him. So. Say, I, I got to let you go. And I'm saying, you know, I hate to tell you this, and this is not my idea. I had nothing to do with this, but we're going to finish you up. Oh, my God. Why? Well, you know, this, you know, Vince felt or somebody else felt that's over him. Vince felt it was time to, but what we're going to, then he would add, say, well, we're just going to let, take you out for maybe six months to a year. And then we're going to bring you back and repackage you with never any intent for that to happen. They would just say that. So if the person was upset uh, about getting moved or replaced, you know, he, he would make sure that they wouldn't blame him. And yeah, he's, he's always been like that. Always will be like that. So she she kind of got Bruce down. And, and Vince, when he was banned from going in there, he would run it through Bruce. He would spend all this time on the phone or or Bruce would go over to his house and he would sit down and, you know, he would tell him what he wanted. So, but, and as long as Bruce was there, Vince is, Vince's influence would be present. Um, Bruce is still there as well. I think we probably both guess that Bruce would have been gone by now, quite frankly, if indeed. Well, I think they, that Bruce is a, you I, know, I a, think a, a Endeavor, Nick Khan are moving cautiously at this point because there's no, there's no need for them to hurry really because when they want something done, they'll just get it done. And, you know, they, they say slow and easy and see where we go. Because business is good. They're not worried about business. WrestleMania is going to be probably one of the biggest WrestleManias they've ever had. 
especially with the rock being, uh, being involved in it. And, uh, and they've told a fantastic story too. Uh, so I, I think they're just waiting back and, and just, they're seeing what's coming down and, but I think, okay, here's another thing that I, I thought. Kevin Dunn finished up when? Before uh, Christmas? first, yeah. End of the year. That was a strange, strange timing, wasn't it? He knew it was coming too. Yeah. Do you, th do you think he's in on that? What, is in threesomes? Probably not, hmm? but. As in threesomes, you mean, or oh no, I don't, I, know. He, he, I, I don't know. I don't know with Kevin Dunn. He's a funny one. He's very close to Vince. Flies on the company jet and all that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. did he know that Vince was about to get fired or this lawsuit was about to come out? I don't know. Maybe he just saw the writing on the wall anyway because Triple H was getting in charge and no one likes Kevin Dunn. And since he's been gone, the production's been hugely oh, it's a lot, upgraded yeah oh, it's a lot better i love those single like they've been doing single camera shots of like a minute and a half or two minutes you know from the entranceway all the way to ringside and they've really you know the the, the making it the production more of an art form than it used to be it's very perfunctory uh when kevin no, Dunn was having it and then the zooming in and out shaky camera thing i, I like that too i just think it just goes a tad too long I mean, you can see those entrances. I mean, Rock's entrance is like a king. That's exactly what it's like when he comes and takes his time, goes down there. Hey, I heard, or did you tell me this? They're going to have two versions of Raw? Oh, this was something that I meant to um, mention this ages ago. So there's a rumor going around that when Raw goes to Netflix, there's going to be a clean version and an uncensored version. Is that something that would appeal to you so you can finally hear The Rock say naughty words, you know, without being bleeped or anything like that? No, but The, the Rock is funny. And it's the way he says it. Because he can say the most horrifically, most vulgar, vulgar language in the world. But if another somebody else was saying it, it'd just be vulgar. But the way he says it, he has it down to an art form. <laughs> it's like, like the Richard he's Pryor quick, or someone like that. He's quick with the jab and he's, you know, quick with the cut down and, and he's hilarious. He's funny. So that's what I'm saying. I, I, the people love rock and they love what they're seeing right now. But I want to know some more scuttlebutt. It's what I want to know. I want to know all of it. Well, because that's what that's what that's what, okay. We did an, an uh, a show, and we did our highest view count ever. We did three hundred and fifty thousand views, three hundred sixty, something like that. And it was it wasn't that a special deal we did. Yeah, and you know, we, were a, we were a day late as well, and I can't remember why. I just couldn't make it for some reason. Uh, that we we would have had that out a day earlier, otherwise. But yeah, yeah, we you, just did a special episode because we always said we'd do a special episode if, uh, you know, there was a big enough reason, like, uh, brawl out or Vince leaving. Uh, and the Janelle Grant thing. So we've done a few specials like that. All right, I'm going to throw something else at you. Okay. Where is Vince right now? Is he still in Connecticut, do you think? Oh, God knows. He's probably still in his penthouse. In Florida? Could be. Could be still in Connecticut. Could be in Florida. Could be traveling the world. Eh, I don't know. No, uh, ever, too many people know Vince. What if Vince is on a cruise and somebody said, Hey, <laughs> hey, you son of a bitch. <laughs> How'd you get in that big mess you're in? Oh, you boy, you you may be going to jail. They're talking about jail time. I, I read mm -hmm. the other day. Do you, 
Do you know the first cruise I ever went on a couple of years ago? No, say I Vance was, walking... was on it. No, he wasn't on it. Um, if he was, I, I wouldn't have shared the hot tub with him. But um, <laughs> but, you know, I was walking around that cruise with shorts on with pineapples on it. And yeah. apparently that's like some sort of swinging thing that I had no idea about until like I was on that cruise that someone told me like upside down pineapples means you're a wife swapper. Yeah, they have a a village here in Florida, and it's called the Villages, and it's where, I, and it is a retirement community. It's huge, and they say they that's a swingers community, and these these people are like 70, 80, 90 years old. I mean, what the hell? But that's what it's known for. Wow. And so one guy said, hey, I live at the village and I never heard of it. <laughs> he said, nobody's talking to me. <laughs> but what do you mean that the pineapples were upside down or whatever? I it said to, something I, I, about I, you, your well, sexual apparently preference? So, yeah, yeah, apparently my proclivities, I was, I was unbeknownst to me, advertising, advertising upside down pineapples. And I was in a lift and someone pointed at my shorts and like laughed. And I was like, I don't get it. And then my <laughs> missus told me, oh, that means something here. I was like, all right. So there you go. And that, Well, they went overboard, the shorts, and I had to wear something else. Well, you've but had yeah, some yeah. weird experiences. Yeah. See, I've never had that. That's not. Because I never wore, weird. well, people I hang out with, they would, upside down pineapple would just mean upside down pineapple. <laughs> they wouldn't think of it think of anything else but no it was, it was something like um is it al pacino i can't remember if it was al pacino cruising and you you know all those like different colored handkerchiefs would mean if you like to be pissed on or if you like to be on top or something like that hey this is a clean show i cannot believe Not anymore baby <laughs> hey we could go attitude era 2.02 yeah we could see there you go. The but even I was, pineapple. and I told I told you this a couple of weeks ago that it is is it, it's another attitude era. That's what it reminds me of. Because the Rock had a had a lot to do with it. I wonder how long before Stone Cold makes some appearances. You know now, he's going to make them. Now, you know he's going to make them. That brings up something I want to bring up to you. We sort of skipped ahead with Ronda Rousey because I sort of left that quite late on. But further back up, I've just seen here, John Cena or or Steve Austin return. Now, the the Cody Rhodes rock beat down from the uh, week before last Raw. And at one point, the camera goes on the rock. And it's the old Tennessee switcheroo while Cody bleeds, essentially. So the camera's on The Rock for a few seconds, and then there's a truck behind The Rock with John Cena and Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. Some people, some internet types, have looked at that and think, is that foreshadowing a return of John Cena and Steve Austin to WrestleMania 40? So do you think that was some sort of like clever subterfuge, some subliminal messages from WWE, or was it a coincidence? Well, they have those trucks all the time. I think... WrestleMania is the time for some surprises. You know, it's already sold out, so you don't need to advertise these people. But I think I think Austin will be there. I think Cena will be there. And I think they will... I think after that, whatever they do with Cody coming back, I think if... If that Stone Cold met The Rock in in the walkway back and end the show on that, I think you'd have everybody. Even though, how old is Stone Cold? 59 or 60, I think. Now, how old is Rock? Early 50s, 53, okay. maybe. Well... I think that would be just an image. You know the old saying, an image that were, or a picture that will live in infamy? 
Mm -hmm. I think if you had the rock just meet stone cold in the, in the, on the way, you know, that little thing, they go to the ring, that little channel. I think the internet, I think it breaks the internet. I think it would, but you're not saying anything. You, 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 they just meet and they, they just look at each other and you put your own meaning to it. And that could be, that could be, uh, I think if he's, if the, if Stone Cold is involved the first night, he'd have to be involved the second night too. Mm -hmm. So, but it's just, it's just, it, I, I'm just thinking if they want surprises, that would be one of the biggest surprises they could do. And now that I've, and I just thought about it since you brought it up. <clears throat> They don't got to do nothing. Just have a meet on the way back. And Rock's got that belt or whatever in his hands and got a little blood on it. And they've already whipped Cody's ass and the laid him out. And, and it, now, okay. Are you a wrestling fan? You are. Hmm. Okay. So, but. If he was walking back and all of a sudden Stone Cold out of the blue, you know, you see him coming and now what's he going to do? And he just meets Rock and you end your show on that. What would you think? I think that stadium would go insane. Hmm. Philadelphia, it would go literally insane. Then what if you're watching it and Rock looking at Stone Cold and all of a sudden, I'm in the background going, hey, hey, I'm trying to, hey, James, hey, <laughs> Steve, how'd the podcast do this week? How'd it do? How'd it do? But, but see, they, they got the tools because, see, the thing about using a guy like Stone Cold or Cena, there's no get over time. You can just bring them in, you know, pluck them off a tree, boom, bring them in, get, do your deal. And they're gone again. Yeah, I think, and I don't, I don't think uh, Stone Cold would be. He, he couldn't do a match. He gave the worst. What, what was the the what was the stunner? Did didn't he give Vince a stunner? One of the worst stunners ever. Yeah, but that wasn't Steve Austin's fault. That was who, who did that? No, no, it was Vince's fault. That was Vince's fault. Yeah. He was all over the place. <laughs> the thing but they is, even when he was vital in his 50s, he couldn't take a stunner. So when he's, you know, 180, he's... <laughs> that's why he just turns to dust. You know, if, if you get out of the ring for a while and then you try to go back in there, you can't do it. No, you can go and train. And that's what I'm worried about, Rock. He's been out of the ring all these years and he's in great shape. But is he in wrestling shape? Mm. That's different. He'll be practicing. I'll guarantee you he'll be practicing. Because yeah, when, you even can, 10 you years can, ago. You he, can be um, practicing. Kurt, Kurt Hennig's son, he was training with, I think. Well, you can be practicing and get in the ring, but then he looks great, but is he loose enough to do it? See, those guys... I've been in a ring with some guys and they, they look great, especially the big muscle guys, but they blow up. Now I don't think rock is going to blow up and blow up. If you don't know what that means, that means just run out of steam. You run out of oxygen. You're huffing and puffing. And, but I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. If stone cold shows up, you know, they're watching the show. <clears throat> we're going to get but, to oh it's too it's too late now anyway but it might show them that we're along the same lines that triple h is mm. who is the guy that writes for rock what's his name brian gerwitz yeah yeah we are going to do a 
we're going to do a couple more bits of uh, short bits of news. Then we're going to get onto the CM Punk interview. We're going to do the highlights of that. And then we're going to call it a day after that. But very quickly, uh, a couple of days ago, Bray White WWE documentary aired. But then it finished with a pretty overt tease of the return of, of all people, Uncle Howdy. Mm -hmm. So you'll cash your mind back 18 months or so, and you've got the mysterious Uncle Howdy and then Bray White coming on SmackDown every week. And it just never really went anywhere, any of it. And then the no. last we saw of Uncle Howdy, Bobby Lashley murdered him, and then he disappeared, and then Bray disappeared, and it turns out it was for health reasons, and uh, he passed away, and he's not coming back. Uh, but now Uncle Howdy is returning, played by Bo Dallas. I've never been blown away by Uncle Howdy. See, I was never blown away by Bray Wyatt, really. Because he would do interviews and he was a good talker. <clears throat> but right to, now I'm, I'm talking strictly for me. And I would sit in the dressing room when I was with WWE and I would listen to his interview. And they never really, they weren't coherent at all. As soon as he finished, my first thought was, what did he say? Because none of it stayed with me. Now, maybe one out of, say, six did. One out of five. But I just... I, and see, they wanted people to dislike Bray Wyatt, but they didn't. They liked him. And you know, one reason they liked him is he didn't cheat to win. He just went in there and he'd wrestle a pretty good match and he just beat the guy. So no need to get mad at that. He just beat the guy. Uh, so you can get mad at Rock. You can get mad at Roman or pissed off at him. Or you can get mad at Gunther because he's beating the crap out of him. Or, so, or you can get mad at Grayson Waller or Theory. But there was no need... Bray was a, a, a baby face heel, the best way I could put it. He was a, a tweener, but the kids liked him. And he sold a lot of merchandise too. So that's probably why they kept him around. Yeah, but as far as getting heat, uh he would uh they would do the the phones and you know and they darkened the, the building and so uh, but well, where does where does both uh, Dallas then Uncle fit in? I don't know how they would use Uncle Howdy. Yeah, really exactly. Don't. Because I mean they barely used him when Bray Wyatt was there. So where does if indeed he does come back as Uncle Howdy, well, how do you use him? Well, if you're asking me, I don't have a clue how how they would use that guy. And I, I like I like the brother. Brother's very nice to me. Mm-hmm. I was going to but ask you I, about him because he but, was, yeah, he was there when you were there with Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Bo, Bo Dallas. I remember Jack wrestled him one time. He had a good match. And, but he was, he was, he was Bo Dallas that night, but the uncle howdy thing, they didn't give it a reason for you to fear him. See, I think Bray was trying to do the deal, like trying to get that uh, fascination like the Undertaker had, but he never got it. And I mean, I'm not docking him and, you know, he's gone, even if he, he heard this and he, and, he, and he wanted to rebut what I'm saying. I mean, he can't, but he, he worked his ass off and... I think even Undertaker, did Undertaker ever work with uh, Bray Wyatt? He did. Uh, he worked with him at WrestleMania. And I, I don't remember it being that good of a match. I don't think. But he, he, think came, out, he came out late, He came out recently and says if he lost his streak, he wanted it to be Bray Wyatt. He did say that, yes. Would break. But I don't think they. Do I don't think they had any chemistry together. 
I sort of know what you mean. I think in ring, I, this has cast in my mind quite a few years ago. I, I remember that match not being the greatest. But it'd be hard-pressed to tell you what happened in it, quite frankly. It was a bit forgettable, dare I say. This was on a WrestleMania? It was, yeah. I'm wondering if this is one of the ones where Undertaker had a concussion immediately. I can't remember. Was that the one with him and Brock? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. With him and Bray, I don't know, but I can't remember. Um, hey, I, yeah. I have my own thoughts on the Undertaker streak. I don't think nobody should have broken the streak. It's one of those things you just leave it alone. It had gone 20 something years, right? 21. Mm hmm. And then, and I was there the night he got broken. I was in, it was in New Orleans, right? And the people were literally stunned. And you've seen the video when he comes back into to the dressing room, right? And he comes down the hallway, you know, Vance wraps him up and hugs him. And, but I don't think it hurt Taker at all, but it's one of those things that hits a record and I don't want it to be broken. You know what the undertaker's doing now? Podcast. He's doing voice. Yeah. He's doing voiceovers for them. Hmm. So that's good. What, what, what is he doing? What, what uh, project Sponsored is he working on now? Slim Jim. Like that. It should be a Randy Savage voice. No. But Savage is not with us, so he can't do it. So no, I don't want to yell. I'm in a hotel room. No, but they I, might, they I, might I, throw me out. He doesn't use the Undertaker voice, does he? I don't know. I pres- no, I, I think he would use his normal voice. Uh, we'll leave the Undertaker voice. It was very briefly. Is Bo Dallas now the Lanny Poffo of uh, the modern times? As in, he's hired, and then they just don't do anything with him, so he just sits at home and <laughs> cashes checks. Because he's pretty Maybe. much at that point of this uh, at this stage. Maybe. Hey, good for because, him. If you can get because it. it's not like it's going to hurt them to pay another guy. It's big E return. So he fractured his C1 vertebrae and C6 vertebrae during the March 11, 2022 episode of SmackDown. The injury happened when Big E landed on his head while taking overhead belly to belly suplex. Big E said he still does not have an update regarding a potential return to the ring. We don't, unfortunately. This is a quote. I appreciate everyone still asking. C1 is a tricky bone, and I broke it in two places, something called a Jefferson fracture. I'll speed through this. Essentially, I think WWE has almost left the ball in his court, whether he wants to attempt a return or not, but this is the most important thing. Quote, I didn't get into wrestling to end up in a wheelchair or worse. I started wrestling when I was 23, and at 23, the idea of being 38, which is the age I'm at now, feels so far off the idea of what life in your 40s and 50s looks like and feels like an eternity from now. But now those are real things and consequences that I think about. It's one of those things I've been an athlete my whole life as playing tackle football at seven, da 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 But essentially, he's, he's been sensible and basically looking at the rest of his life and is the risk of re I think he's I think he's it. I think he's been out too long. I really do. And I think he's thinking about that. And you know his wife is. You know, because it, if it could happen once, it could happen again. Now the neck is already or the or the spine what is it, C six? C one and C six. Well it's it's too big of a liability for him and his family for him to take that chance. I think if I was him, I'd just say, yeah, my wrestling days are over. And I just keep the job at WWE because they'll have him doing something. Oh, yeah. And he'll be an ambassador or something. I mean, they'd never let him go. I don't think he's a great ambassador for them, but also if he did come back and he's had that injury, that would surely affect his performance. I mean, you'd be second guessing a lot of stuff, wouldn't you? Uh, you oh yeah. Like Every time somebody wants to, for him to take a, see in wrestling, you got to take those hard bumps. People don't understand how tough a business wrestling really is. And I came along in the era. It wasn't big money. 
it, it wasn't big money and you traveled like six, seven days a week. You traveled. You're my, you're my printer. Yeah. I was just looking at your prints. <laughs> oh yeah. But <laughs> no, I can't hear it though. Carry on. Oh, you can't hear it. No, no. But, uh, somebody was telling me, or did you tell me you don't, Oh, you did tell me that you can't believe the travel that we did. Yeah. And you couldn't do it because you traveled from the, uh, from the, from England to to Island, which over is to, 30, to Dublin. How far yeah, is that? Hour? It's a 35 minute trip. But the problem is, is that you have to get there two hours beforehand, all the delays, and then you treat like crap. And then they look through your bag and then, and then your flight to Philly gets cancelled. So then you have to hang around the airport for another hour. And then you've got to hang about an, air, an hour for the transfers for the hotel. Then you've got to wait half an hour to get seen in because so many other people have had the flight cancelled. And it's just just the standing around and waiting. Flying, flying's exhausting. And the fact that I can't no believe that you... And, a, and you, you know, if you're injured and you can't sit comfortably in your chair or you can't stand comfortably for two hours while you're in a you know, in the, in line See, to check your bag in. I think one thing for a, a wrestler that, that's a hell, hell of an ex existence, say, you know, we went to uh, South Africa when I was in WWE. What if one of the guys, not me, what if one of the guys had gotten hurt and had to make that trip back? You know, and it's, I think it was from uh, Pretoria or Johannesburg that we flew from all the way to New York. You know how long that trip is? Probably like what, 14? Seven, 17 and a half hours. Oh. It's almost a day yeah. you spend on a plane. And when you get off, for the next day or two, you're all out of sync because that really messes, uh, messes with your metabolism. It throws it all off. and But you don't have time to recover. Guess what? As soon as you get back to New York, you got to go to Raw or you got to go to SmackDown or you got to go somewhere. They're not going to let. And the most I've ever, and I've told you this before, to, to tell the people what a brutal business this was. I was in WCW and they were running seven days a week, double shows, had two crews, one crew, seven days somewhere. And the other crew would go out to the Midwest. I worked during one period, 64 straight days before I went home 64 and finally I, I told him I said guys I said, hell I gotta go I can't do this oh okay well we'll so he give me a day off a day but hey I, that's what I signed on to do so you can't go there and, and you want to work and then start bitching but 64 straight days that is a little ridiculous I, I would think so your advice to Big E is, I mean, obviously we've just been talking about all that traveling. Stay home. Oh, it's it's it's, it's brutal, brutal. And now guys talk about guys don't work anything near the schedule that wrestlers of before their time worked. And now most of them are flying. Hell, the closest we got to a plane was passing an airport. That's the, the oh, there's a plane, there's a plane. So, yeah, we'd we'd be in a car, two or three of us. But great stories. That's where I, that's where I learned the business. So you want to talk about Ronda Rousey again? Uh, she's doing a lot of interviews when she just seems to just be full of just hate towards the WWE, and she's really bitter about her tight the second run anyway. So she also uh, this came out. I can't remember if it's today or yesterday. Of my as we record this, we're almost coming up to midnight anyway. I was standing there 
And this guy I was barely an acquaintance with grabs the string of my sweatpants as I'm walking by and nobody reacts as if this is abnormal. And he's going down the hall and I'm like, what the F is that? Why are you grabbing the string of my sweatpants? If my husband was standing there next to me, would you feel comfortable walking up to me and grabbing the string of my sweatpants? All the guys around me were like, this is part of the day. And if this guy was coming up to me and doing this kind of stuff to me, uh, when there are other people around, what's happening to these other girls when I'm not in the hallway? Eventually, she mentions this guy called Drew Gulak. And Gulak wrote, pretty sure it's today as we record this as a Wednesday. Backstage at a WWE event in 2022, I saw Ronda talking with the group in the hallway. I stopped to say hi and shake all their hands. And in an attempt to shake her hand, I accidentally touched her drawstring. Complete accident. And one that I had apologized for, for the mishap. So, hmm. Who do you believe? Well, you know who I'm believing there? Go on. I'm ble- I believe Drew. I don't, I've never even met Drew. But why would he go up to her? I'm saying... She was a big star. Drew was nowhere close to her level. Why would he do that? Like just reach out and grab her drawstring. I don't think he did that. I think he did it by accident. Like he said he did. And she got all pissed off about it. But see, this is the deal. Ronda Rousey, she got her ass beat MMA. And then Holly Holmes knocked her out. And, then, and that other girl beat her. She won. She went from invincible to getting beat every match. So all of a sudden her mystique was shattered. So then she had to go to wrestling. And you got to admit, she wasn't the greatest at wrestling either. And damn sure wasn't the greatest as a talker. And the way she looked didn't fit WWE standards. So... I don't think uh, John Laurinaitis got her out of a magazine and talked to her <laughs> and wanted her to model something down to the ring. But I, I didn't, I think she owes a lot to WWE. And of course, I, they probably owe a lot to her too because she legitimized a lot of the women's wrestling when she came over. But I think she got pissed off and she's got a mouth and she was saying these things while she was still there. And I don't know why somebody, but this is when Vince was still in charge. And I don't know why somebody didn't tell her, hey, tone it down or quit, quit telling all this stuff. But I, I just I just don't believe her story on that. Touching somebody's drawstring seems rather... Well, it's funny that I never heard this story before. Hmm. It just It just comes out now. Well, she's left WWE now. She just seems, and she's got a book to sell, so she just seems to be getting every single gripe off her chest. But also, I don't know. Like, would, do you think she's looking for reasons to get upset with WWE or anything to do with WWE, even when she's there? Because apparently, she had a terrible time. Well, yeah, she had a terrible time. She was knocking the place always, and she had to know about that. Extra, extra curricular activity that the boss was engaged in. Because yeah, she was in there she with says them. No. She says no. Oh, shit. I'm, I'm, I, hey, if I had a flag, like a referee, I'd throw the flag right there. She knew about it. She said she didn't know about it. I think in a book has basically said, well, all these things have come out, but I'd assume that she's talked, you know, she's in the women's locker room. They must have talked about this at some point where Vince tried this or John Laurinaitis tried that kind of thing. I bet she probably knows a little more than she's laying on or at least heard stories. No, she wants to be, she wants to be clean hands with it. Yeah. Like she didn't know anything was going on well, until he- you can I don't know. not know. You can not know. You can hear rumors. I mean, maybe, maybe that's sort of like the get out of jail free. Well, thing. how did, how did I know? How did my guy, uh, Jack Swagger? How did he know? How did um, Cesaro know? How did everybody know? It, it was a common uh, truth or knowledge that. And Vince had, had been doing it for years. And Laura Nidas, I, I'd heard the, she had to hear about Laura Nidas. 
She had to. Because he would come in there and do it in front of everybody. Oh, but hey, you can't blame him because he was coerced oh, into course, going yeah. into the ladies' ladies' locker room and you know saying things to him. You know, the whole time I was in WWE, I never went into the where the girls dressed. Well, it's probably it wasn't my place. <laughs> well, no. Are you no, saying Johnny, not... Johnny Laurinaitis used to wander in there, bold as brass? Think he did what now? Did Johnny Ace wander into the women's locker room often? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Really? But he could do that because he was delivering a message, maybe. See what I mean? Oh, I see. And he so would tell them this or tell them that. Right, or... he fabricate reasons to go in. And, hey, it was a... Uh, a really a, a tainted existence when I was in WWE. We, uh, Vince is going to come up again in this, but we're going to go to the main event of this podcast. Now we're going to recap. CM okay. Punk who is this? Who's MMA going to hour. write the first book on this? What's this on Vince? Yeah. Someone wrote a book on Vince and by all intents and purposes, apart from the first couple of chapters where it dealt with Vince's early years, it wasn't very good. So someone's done it and basically done a bad job, according to most reviews I've read. Um, so I think the door is open for somebody else to give it a go. So I don't know. I think a I'd read writer. it. I'd, I'd read it. Yeah. I'd read it. I'm not writing it. I'll tell you that for nothing. No chance. Um, right. We're going to go on to the main event. CM Punk on MMA Hour. You watched it. I watched it. We're going to go through... Uh, sort of the keynotes of it all. We're going to react to some of the things that he said and we're going to take it from there. So Ariel Hawani, I thought he did a great job interviewing as well. I thought Ariel did a really good job interviewing. There's one yeah. thing that I wish he picked up on that he didn't, but other than that, I thought he did a great job. So I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you what it is when we get there. So the okay. notes from the interview, I'm going to rattle through a few and then I'm going to, you know, you jump in, of course. Uh, notes, Cody Rhodes was always meant to win the Royal Rumble. There wasn't an audible called after CM Punk's other triceps then tears and the plan was always going to be that Punk was going to wrestle Seth Rollins for the Raw Championship at WrestleMania 40 I mean there's nothing that we didn't really know there Nick Khan didn't know Punk had uh, didn't have a no compete clause after leaving AEW because Nick Khan according to him would have said well crikey I would have just called you the next day if I'd known but uh, Nick Khan called him on a Monday the Monday before Survivor Series and then five days they've hashed out a contract and he goes out, does the big theme song and everything like that, gets a huge ovation. And well, we're there. When did CM Punk show up in Chicago and was asked to leave by Vince? That was back in May. We're actually, in fact, we're going to come to it straight now. The backstage incident where he was thrown out of the uh, raw backstage in uh, yeah, uh, Chicago. Is it the Allstate Arena in Chicago? Yep, Allstate. Yeah. And waited. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so apparently he said it wasn't a big deal. He talked to a few people uh, after talking to Jason Jordan, who uh, at one point was briefly Kurt Angle's son for some reason. And then he got injured and then he became an agent. And then Bailey ended up being the one to invite him, I think, backstage to the show. Talks to a few people, nods at Triple H. And then Vince McMahon, who was operating through Zoom remotely, gets wind of it and then makes the call to throw him out. Uh, Tony Khan's reaction, apparently, to this was very negative and, uh, you know, to top AEW brass. And Punk, quotes said the word that he heard more than any other was betrayed. As in, Punk had betrayed AEW by going backstage to the WWE show. Is that, <laughs> bit, is that heavy-handed for you, or? Hey, it's a wrestling business. He didn't have a non-compete. Well, he wasn't competing. He was just visiting friends. He wasn't going on TV or anything. Yeah, but I'm saying in a, it was a, a non-compete means that, I mean, they could interpret that way. He went to the show and people picked up on it. Fans took a picture of him and everybody saw him standing out in the parking lot talking to uh, one of the Rock's cousins, I guess. What was her name? Oh, was it Tamina? Yeah, talking to her. 
Then he went in the building for a while, right? Yeah, and then he was. Uh, then they asked uh, him to asked, leave yeah. because Vince didn't want any trouble from with AEW. Like they're they're tampering, like they're tampering with a uh, with a, with a talent. But say, but he does have something in his contract about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, I don't even know if AEW or Tony Khan had reached out to CM Punk after the injury. I think they probably had by that point, but we'll get to this later. But after... Um... But I thought CM Punk, when he went there, he was still actively working for AEW. Yeah, he was still under contract with AEW, but this was in that very long period in between him injuring his triceps, brawl out, and then he was on the shelf for nine months. So this was during the point he was still on the shelf in like May, okay. I think. So uh, he then says he saw Vince McMahon once at Titan Towers, then never saw him again. Unlike uh, Cena and Nash and Foley and others who have been, as we as we actually said, for a reason as well, in John Cena's case, uh, overly kind to Vince McMahon in regards to uh, the alleged offences. Punk gives a pretty definitive uh, sentiment about McMahon is that his thoughts are with the victim, victims of McMahon's and he essentially has nothing positive to say about McMahon. But then Punk also references Chris Benoit. And he says he saw Chris Benoit in the locker room the week before the murder-suicide where his uh, where Chris's son Daniel was taping his fist like Punk in tribute to him. And, you know, it's a really fond memory of his. And then, you know, a week ha happens and Benoit kills himself and his family. And Punk is like, well, yeah, that was a really nice memory. But then Benoit's ruined it. And it doesn't, you know, I had a lot of respect for him, but he killed his family. I cannot have respect for this guy. Mm -hmm. And because you thought, yeah, exactly, because you thought a person was one thing and they turn out to be another, then at least in his mind, you can't really feel affection for that guy anymore. And a lot of people still feel affection for Vince, etc. I want to follow with this, and this sort of relates to it. Uh, with Chris Benoit, you'll of course remember in 2000, it was like June 2007 or July 2007, the shockwaves that the Benoit murder suicide sent through the wrestling world and the wider world, in fact, it was, it was headline news even here. Yeah. Just how close do you believe that Chris Benoit's actions came to inadvertently taking down the wrestling business in the aftermath? Because people have said he could he could have destroyed the business. That's how serious his actions were. Uh, he couldn't have destroyed the business. I mean, what he did was horrible. Killed his old lady first, didn't he? Didn't he kill the old lady first? Yeah. Then he killed his boy the next day, right? Yeah. Which goes to show you that he was he was nuts. Legitimately crazy. And I don't know if he had CTE, the city did. I first met him in Calgary, I don't know, back in the 90s. And I looked down there, and he came up, and he introduced himself. But I asked somebody, I said, who is that guy? And they said, oh, it's Chris Benoit. And I just heard the name because I think he'd made some shots with, uh, with the Paul Heyman group, ECW. ECW. Yeah. So, but he didn't, he really didn't look like, he, he looked odd. But if you really look at him in the face, he he he's a weird looking guy. He's about he's not tall. He's about five seven, five eight maybe, and maybe he he would two hundred pounds, not much over that. But I don't think it would have brought the wrestling business down. Hey, the wrestling business has lived through tragedies like this before. I mean, that's almost like saying, well, somebody that does something in auto racing, I'm not going to bring auto racing down. That was just what he did. Or if he did, he's a big star in basketball and he did, he, he does something. No, it's not going to affect the game. It affects the person, but I don't, I don't think that it would, it would hurt pro wrestling at all. Do you, do you think, I mean, it, it doesn't help it. That's for damn sure. Oh. But I don't, I don't think it'd take it down. 
Well, I was, well, maybe not the wrestling business as a whole, because nothing can kill the wrestling business, as uh, we've discussed before. But Because we've tried for 50 years to kill this business, and guess what? We still can't do it. Do you think and they're still, but they're still trying. Oh yeah, still trying. Do you think WWE could have uh, been taken off air over it? Do you think that yeah. was ever likely? I think, hey, because whatever network they were on, listen, the TV business is like the rest of it; it's cutthroat. And if they were on USA, then they've been on USA for. If USA had cut them loose, no, they're not gonna. They're not gonna cut loose a client like WWE. And guess how long it would have taken for another another network to pick it up? Seconds. Seconds, absolutely. They said, "Hey, okay." And I think it'd be a big legal, a legal struggle back and forth because they were taking the the livelihood away from what four hundred people. On more, the actions of one, huh? Yeah, more, more I'd say, yeah. with and all the office staff and, yeah. And I don't know, but no. Uh, I always, uh, and he was another guy that I was kind of not at peace with being around. I never talked to him much. And he was, I was around him a little bit. It was just, hey, how you doing? And I'm, I'm moving on somewhere else. You with with TNA booking at the time in two thousand and seven. Now WWE over the course of the next year it starts to go PG. Obviously, it coincides with Linda McMahon running for Senate, as I said before, whatever she ran for. And um, they also, as we discussed earlier, stop blood completely mm -hmm. erase like weapon shots to the head, or especially like chair shots, <laughs> anything hard. You know, like nothing like a cookie tray or something like that. I guess. But um, did TNA? Uh, implement any changes like you know no more weapon shots of that essentially you know like concussion management or was tna was just like it was a wasn't tna that put the the uh, hiatus on it it was a uh, spike tv was it really oh they said no blood no touching women mm. and i'm thinking and look at it now guys hell you you got guys fighting women now wrestling women racing them, you know, running the long distance races. <clears throat> so, so we, we couldn't do anything with women. We couldn't even touch them because, oh, that was a no, no. We're not going to do that. Spike TV. I'm thinking, come on, give it to me. I mean, they weren't that hot of a network anyway. And they were pretty good to, they were pretty good to TNA, but, uh, the thing with blood, we we didn't get it then either. CM Punk said he's happy The Rock is back, which is sort of ironic because he was very vocal a decade ago about these part-timers taking spots from year-long main events at WrestleMania, but he's got no issues breaking uh, Rock, breaking the rules, because so does Punk. But now here comes the interesting stuff. All in Wembley. Punk talks about what a stupid idea having the roster split between Collision and Dynamite is because it never would have worked. He said it from the beginning. And before Collision became a thing, when he was still out with the triceps tear, he begged Tony Tony Khan to just fire him instead. Tony refused. And then uh, Jack Perry, who was a known associate of the EV, but well, yeah, you know, Collision happens. And then a few weeks later, Jack Perry turns up <clears throat> to an episode of Collision. And this is where the car thing happens. So, a known associates of the EVPs, the Young Bucks and Adam Page, not that he's an EVP, and Kenny Omega, but they're all part of the same clique. Um, the initial issue was that Jack Perry was yelling at agents and then the doctor and then Tony Schiavone about not being allowed to use uh, a real glass for a outside vignette where he was told to get a rental car and then they were going to do something with glass to then, I don't know if he was like going to punch it through or he was going to get put through, I can't. Just it's so late, I just can't remember. Sorry, everybody. But essentially, they were playing with real glass. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so in the end, Shivani goes up to Punk and says, Can you deal with this, please? And Punk says, I don't want to deal with this because you won't like the way I handle it. And Shivani was like, No, you've got to deal with it. 
So Punk ends up handling it very nicely. He says, look, there's two reasons. One, this is a rental car and we don't want to get a bad reputation with the rental agency. And two, you shouldn't be using real glass because it's real glass and it could go disastrously wrong. And there's no reason to risk it. Uh, the only other thing is that, uh, I can't remember if I said this yet, that Jack Perry had a holiday planned and he was going to be gone for a week or two. And that was the reason why he wanted to do it. Here's the thing, is that CM Punk's not wrong. Jack Perry's not really wrong here because somebody in the office, I imagine Tony Khan, or somebody told him to get the rental car to yes. then do this glass thing. Yeah, but see, that's conveniently left out in this whole conversation. Exactly. Who told him to do this and who okayed for him to even do the spot? Because Punk knew about it, right? Mm -hmm. Did, well, he, he was made aware Tony of it. Only yeah. Shivani knew about it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. See, I think Tony wants to he wants to be the boss. But didn't want he didn't want to handle the tough stuff. All he had to do was tell Jack, "Don't do it. Why don't you take do something else?" But they told him to get a car, I guess. Or would he have gotten a? Don't they drive on the other side of the road in in the UK? Yes, the correct side. Yes. Wait a minute. No, no, no. But that's that's not Wembley. This is on collision a few weeks beforehand. Okay, where did okay? He got the car in the states, and this wasn't in Wembley. No, no, no. This is a few weeks beforehand. We'll get to okay. Wembley soon enough. When yeah. did he say it's real glass, cry me a river, or something? That's when. That's Wembley. That's jumping slightly ahead. So just just prior. This is a few weeks beforehand with the rental car, and it's confusing because there's two separate rental cars where glass is involved. But the point is, is that Tony Khan is at every single AEW taping. He's never missed one. So why wouldn't someone just go and get Tony and say, you deal with it? Has he got some sort of mandate where he says, if there's any kind of confrontation, do not include me? Where were your EVPs? <laughs> well, were they? They, were all they were all banned from collision. They were all had to be on dynamite to split away from Punk. So essentially, yeah. Punk is the... he had When he came back, he had two different contracts. One a talent contract, and one a contract as a sort of agent official of collision so to a point what he said goes <laughs> yeah so it gets even more complicated so he's almost the evp of collision the evps are only the evps of dynamite now or maybe rampage and then you've got jack perry who the evps he's in with the evps and doesn't like cm punk it's very confusing well i've said this before i think this was all laid out way, way in advance. Punk was going to WWE come hell or high water. And I think he just wanted to be done with the AEW. Anyway, I think he got, I think he wanted to get fired. I've said that before. I think he pretty much. I think he pretty much said it himself in the interview. I don't have the quote for you, sadly. But uh, when I was watching it, he do I get credit for it. saying? Do I get credit for saying that? You can. You can take the credit. Thank you. Thank you very much. But, but yeah, I, I, he, th I think he wanted to see. I've said how many times can I say Tony Khan is not a boss? He just wants to be in creative. Now one day he's going to snap. You're going to get mad at everybody, cuss everybody out. Probably be one of the best things he could do. He needs to show a little authority. And what we were talking about it earlier, you cannot be a friend to the, they call them the boys, the talent. You can't be a friend to the boys and run the show. It doesn't work. It never has worked. Because like you said, you know, all of a sudden there'll be these guys hanging around him, making him laugh, do this. And then he's got an idea. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, you know, and, and do it. See, Tony, I don't know how he ever envisioned himself as a booker. He just wants to be the booker. Okay. You got a billion dollars. You can be a booker. All you got to do is go out and buy talent. If you had a billion dollars right now, James, you get on the phone 
and call these non-committed, you know, some talent. Free agents. Yeah, free agent and call them up and say, hey, we're going to do this. But a lot of them, are, they have issues. And I don't know what happened to Elephant Boy, Jack Perry. I don't know what happened to him. But I think putting him with Punk, I don't think Punk works well with the little smart asses. So. We we definitely need Elephant Boy, Jack Perry. <laughs> yeah, but he was. He was Jungle he, Boy. He, he went to Japan. When did he drop the Jungle Boy deal? Apparently, that was at Jim Ross's insistence. He just kept refusing to call him Jungle Boy and use his real name. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, you know, it, it, it kept creeping. Now that that he, should be another you know. Booker's decision. Mm. That's not an announcer's decision. And I mean, and Ross was probably doing it for the right reasons. But just to take it on himself, just to, you know, you have to really notice it. it didn't mean nothing anyway. But I think he wanted to call him Elephant Boy. It didn't fit him or something. I... Do you know See, that was Sabu's first name? I think Sabu the Elephant Boy or something really, like that. I think, I think yeah. it was his name. Yeah. But Jim Ross is from the, he's from the old school. He's from the uh, uh, Bill Watts old school wrestling and those people in Louisiana and in that part of the country, Memphis, they had tremendous ratings. Memphis beat them all really because it was a live show and you could adjust that show up to the moment you went out on camera and it was up to date. See the um, the Mid South show with Watts and Jim Jim Ross. It was taped, and you had to go with what you had on, on paper. But Memphis, they had such ratings. I mean, their ratings were astronomical. They would do on Saturday morning what a what they used to call prime time. They don't really have prime time anymore. TV's undergoing a a revolution now, I think streaming and, you know, all these other pay, pay to view uh, services are taken away from them. But when you would do a 22 rating, that was what Dallas was getting, but that was in prime time. So, and it wasn't because the wrestling was so good in Memphis. It's just that they had people over and they told a good story. And they use cars as well in Memphis occasionally with Eddie Gilbert well, driving. We need we need to watch that. We need to watch that sometime if we haven't already. That's the car with Lawler. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, that was that was a pretty good bump he took. No, he's a stuntman. Just a natural huh? stuntman, Lawler. And he wanted to he he wanted to aim it at Eddie Marlin. But Eddie, of course, couldn't have got out of the way. You know, the police came and wanted to arrest Eddie. Oh, you really? know that, right? No, yeah. I didn't know that. Because the fans called in on Eddie that he'd run over at Lawler, and it was like a attempted murder. And they went over there, and they pulled into the parking lot, came into the station, and talked to Eddie. So. <laughs> well, no, I had you no get, idea. You didn't know that? No, I didn't. I didn't yeah. know they tried to arrest him. I know they arrested Billy Joe Travis that time, but yeah, I didn't know the Eddie one. But yeah, that was that was another deal. But they they come. They wanted to arrest Eddie. They they really did. We'll uh, we'll go through that. We'll save that for uh, the full story. We'll try. I don't have the technology at the moment. We have it, we haven't have seen that it. already. I thought we we showed that. I'm not sure we did with Billy Joe Travis, but I'm not sure about Eddie Eddie Graham Eddie uh, Gilbert. Um, yeah. Everybody write into us and let us know if we've done that already. But otherwise, uh, we'll continue with this. But as I say, there's a car there, car in Memphis. Now we're going back to a car again. So there's the Perry, uh, Jack Perry says, it's real glass, grind me a river, you know, score. At Wembley, and then Punk confronts, and his sort of quote here, chokes Perry a little bit. He doesn't punch him, 
Uh, and he says that's his way of being professional, which is, I mean, really your way of being professional is just yell at him or something. But uh, apparently, you know, he had to choke him a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Samoa Joe tells him to stop and he does. You know what I would have done? Okay, I'm thinking. Yeah. Wrestlers are great at working scams. If he'd have grabbed me like that, I would have went down. I would have stayed down. I'd have been transported to the hospital on the gurney. I'd have let them check me in. I'd stay three or four days. And I would, I would say he hurt, he hurt me. And who would be responsible for that? The company. Yep. The building, the city. And I'd be, I'd, I'd have a hell of a lot better slot than I had before with more money. So, and I don't know why he didn't do it. I think it surprised the, uh, I'm going to call him Jungle Boy. It surprised Jungle Boy too. But, he, and I and, and I, I would go to sleep tonight always believing that Punk wanted to get fired. I think you're right. I mean, he, he's already said that he wanted to quit after the brawl out thing. So he definitely wanted to quit on this and he knew it wouldn't work. So I think you're probably right. Okay. Um, in the match, he, in the match. Yeah. Immediately following the Jack Perry incident, yeah. Punk went out to work with Samoa Joe. He did. Yeah. And how was that match? You were there. It was good. I think, I think it was the best match on the card. Everyone mm -hmm. else disagrees. So but, that uh, just goes yeah. to show you Punk, he knows what he's doing. He knows, and he's the type that <clears throat> he builds that connection with the fans, and he's got them. You know, they just they just like him, and he went out there and he had a match after having a, a scuffle. I call it a scuffle in the dressing room. And who went over in that match? Punk. Mm -hmm. So therefore, which I always thought was funny that Samoa Joe loses clean in the opener. And then six months later, less than six months later, he's the champion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think that made, I mean, you couldn't really predict that, I guess, but you know. Well, what would you, what would you have done in that first match? I don't think that should have been the first match, really. No. Uh, I, I think the reason it was the first match is because once again, it's the first combined pay-per-view after, you know, Punk and the EVPs have to be separated and they've all got to have separate locker rooms. And the reason why Punk was on first was so that he could get in there and get out and then the EVPs could do their stuff later. It's all just high school crap, mm -hmm. basically, isn't it? And uh, who, do, and who, at, at what doorstep does the, uh, does this responsibility stop at? With Tony Khan's, of course. And, right, absolutely. And, and here we go with Tony Khan. Uh, apparently Punk then... We don't know if he put his hands on Tony Khan or just yelled at him. I mean, he might have grabbed his lapels or something. I don't who, know. Who put his hands on who? On Punk, Tony Khan? Punk on, yeah, Punk on Tony Khan. Um, the one thing I that I thought Ariel he just yelled at I think he just yelled at him. We might just yelled at him for all I know. But uh, uh, the, 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 Punk then leaves later, you know, just makes the security guard's job easier and just says, don't worry, I'll go. I'll just leave because I'm just done with the company anyway. Essentially, he tells Tony Khan that he quits. Tony Khan then fears for his life, which is... He says uh, right now. He fears for his life. Yeah. Uh, Tony Khan. Mm. And, uh, you know, he didn't do anything to stop bad feelings festering after brawl outs. Uh, we could go so much further into this, but there's nothing that we haven't talked about before, you know, uh, as far as who's in the right, who's in the wrong, and we'll talk about more about that in a minute. But... Um, Punk scoffs that he was fired because he said he quits and that the fights uh, and that fights happen a lot in the back and it's not really that huge of a deal. It's sort of almost like blowing off steam, especially in the old days, you know, and basically hints that T Tony Khan is a delicate little flower. Um, but the only thing, the only <laughs> thing I really hope for is that uh, uh, Errol. I'm going to take. I'm going to take that. You called him a delicate flower. I'm going to actually send it to him. I'm going to send the link to him. That you, you call should. him a delicate little flower. Yes, but if you do that, he may fear for his life again. Yeah, maybe. So, um, also, uh, Punk says again and again that Tony Khan is not a real boss and that he's a clown and a joke. 
and that AEW isn't a real business because it's not concerned about ticket sales or booking or compelling storytelling or making a profit. Simply Tony puts matches together that he wants to see and then he gauges the success of his business by star ratings or cagematch.net fan voting. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Meltzer rebutted on Wrestling Observer Radio that building a company over putting matches together that he wants to see is not a crime, which it isn't a crime. But it's not really that great of a comeback either, to be honest. Uh, Punk says that what works on indies doesn't work nationally, maybe in bits and pieces, but not all the time. And this has been proven again and again with AEW because they keep going to the return to markets and they sell less tickets every time. So whatever it is, they are not giving fans what they want. Well, something's wrong there. So I, I, I people know how I feel about it. But he needs to be a boss. He needs to be in charge of everything. Now, you know, the bad boy at the moment, Vince McMahon, was in charge of everything. So if you had a bitch and you wanted to talk to anybody, don't talk to an agent. Don't talk to uh, somebody else. You got to go directly to Vince. Of course, a lot of times you're blocked from going to Vince because people figure out what you're going in there for. That was Bruce Pritchard's job to run interference and keep guys away from Vince. Or they John Laurinaitis. To... Say what now? Or John Laurinaitis, because you know talent VP. Yeah. yeah, and it would it would be stopped there because they damn sure wasn't going to bother Vince with anything they considered less than critical. And if I don't know if the only thing that was critical, I think I was trying, I've told this story before I was trying to talk to him and I think it was in Chicago and punk. He waited all day and they went into that Vince's office and they talked this whole time, still didn't work it out. But at least Punk followed protocol. He followed the chain of command until he got to the got to the top guy. But nothing changed. So what else was was he going to do? This leads into the Colt Cabana stuff. So Cabana went up to him to a show at one point in AEW and asked to talk to Punk, and Punk refused, saying he will never speak to him unless there's a lawyer present. So this all stems from issues between their getting sued by WWE and Dr. Chris Amon over suggestions of a medical malpractice on Colt Cabana's Art of Wrestling podcast. And then Punk didn't want to pay Colt's legal fees after a, a certain point. And then Cabana said that Punk could give him a verbal agreement that he would pay the legal fees. And then What's... Cabana then sues Punk. And then apparently, according to Punk, uh, he offered mediation. He even offered a payout to Colt Cabana, and Colt refused them both. And the sort of relationship deteriorated from there. How did how did that situation end up? Uh, I don't think I don't think Colt won. Best I can tell, and I don't want to speak. Didn't, out of didn't they go and... to a private conversation just between them? No. And still, nothing was done. No, I. I... I think no. Punk offered to do certain things, and I don't know. I think Coke Cabana turned him down, or yeah, seems so. So, uh, have, you, have you hung about with Coke Cabana at all? I don't know where he he and you would have crossed paths. Coke Cabana and me, yeah. Well, we didn't really cross paths. We did, but he came to see me when he had a podcast. He wanted me to do a podcast and he called and I went, yeah, I guess. And I forgot where I was, but he come and met me. We were on the road and he come and met me and we went to, he stayed in the same hotel that I was say, stay, staying in. And we went to his room and we did the, we did the podcast. So, and that's the only, I think I met him one other time. But you know, when you're doing a podcast with a guy, you can, you know, you get you get to know him just a little bit, and then 
I, I talked to him and he fine with me. So I'll, uh, I hate to say something. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Didn't punk have a, a, a growth on his back? Yes. So that was the original complaint that there was like some great big growth on his back that the doctors kept allegedly ignoring her to the point. It was like a big cyst or something like that. And that was part of the uh, that was part of the lawsuit that WWE and, and brought so, against him. What did how did Colt get involved in this? Because him and him it and Colt's, it was Colt's podcast. Yeah. So therefore, so he, he was the. So uh, he had he had Punk on his podcast. Yeah. And that's so the doctor Colt, ended Colt. up suing them. Yeah. I know that doctor. What's his name? Chris Amon or a man. Yeah, I know him. He yeah. was, he was, he was there all the time. But I, I, re, I remember, not when he sued him, but I, I remember I meeting him. He was there every week. We uh, were nearly at the end of the script. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping off tired now. So I'll, I'll speed through this quickly. Uh, so, uh, this is probably what has caused the issues between the EVPs and CM Punk because they're all friends with Colt Cabana and then Adam the Page, scrum the scr it's before the scrum in fact it's Adam Page uh, because he's also friends with Colt Cabana according to Punk uh, do you remember this promo this face to face interview they yeah, did yeah, in the yeah. ring and then CM Punk said uh, there was always like a line that um, Adam Page threw in that basically called Punk a cancer to the locker room who nobody likes and he's selfish and blah 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 Essentially, Punk said that Adam Page went entirely off script, did an entirely different promo than Punk was prepared for, and Punk couldn't come up with a rebuttal because all the lines he prepared didn't match anything that Adam Page had said about him. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think, is this, to your mind, or has this ever happened before where you think one thing's going to happen, but then one person's got a beef with another and they just... <laughs> And they just absolutely tear you apart. Not to you, but no, no, never. Because that's the way we learn to do interviews off the top of your head. You know, before I got to WWE, nobody ever handed me a piece of paper and says, "Say this." I said, "Get to get the hell out of here." I'll do my own interview, and I'll, I'll sell it better than what you could come up with. Those writers, I I think sometimes. Writing words down, if you can write it all, you can write down a brief argument. Me and Lawler used to go out on Memphis TV and Jerry Jarrett would say, just shoot it, just talk, just argue with him. He said, you are a hell of an arguer, Dutch, and Lawler is too. So you argue back and forth and he'll say something, you'll say something, he'll come back, you'll come back. Then finally, you work it up and, you know, when you see two guys arguing and the, now the audience, they're starting to pick up on it. They're getting a little louder. They're getting a little more aggressive. And then when it broke out at the end, they were ready for it. I would rather do interviews like that. See, I started to go off script one time. We had John Cena in the ring with me and Swagger. And he goes off script all the time. So... I wanted to then, but I said, ah, I better not. I better stay with the, I better stay with what they got prepared because I'm, I don't even think the writers was even prepared for what I was going to say. But I'm going to say, I'm going to let Cena do his deal because he's a hell of a lot more important than I am. Hmm. So, but I, 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 the only time I did a scripted interview ever, was in uh, WWE. And that's when I did it. That's when they wrote you. They would hand you, read this, say this, say this, say this. and But a lot of times I would go out there and I would just, they wanted you sometimes to do it word for word. I can't do that. First of all, my attention span is not good enough. Was it then? Still, It's still not. But I can get the point across the same way and I get it across the way that I want to say it. People understand it. And the writer was out there trying to win a 
Pulitzer Prize for writing, I guess. It just goes on and on and on. S say you're going to beat the guy's ass, okay? That's all you got to say and mean it. And the people, hopefully, they pick up on it. So I was, I was thinking, you know, uh, so apparently Tony Khan had actually said, you know, there's real life tension between CM Punk and Adam Page. And apparently, in Tony's mind, that, you know, a bit of tension, a bit of real life tension between rivals is a good thing. And he may have even likened it to Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, what happened at the end with Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart? They got into a real fight. And yep. then Bret Hart got ousted from the company after a major uh, screw job. Mm -hmm. And it's like, history just basically repeated itself there. So a real fight broke out, brawl out. And then, and, and then nobody's happy. You remember in Madison Square Garden, it was Diesel, no, it was Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, I think. Triple H and Sean. But anyway, after the match is over, yeah. they all hugged each other. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Vince, I was there that night. Vince was fit to be tied. <clears throat> But he wasn't as mad as I thought he should have been. So I remember after that, Hall and Nash, was they were going to WCW. So they left. Uh, Shawn, Shawn Michaels, they couldn't punish him because he was the champion. So who did they punish? Triple H. And this went on at least six months because every night he was looking at the lights every night and I would go watch it and he'd have a good match. And one time it was just like a, a, a live event. Wasn't TV or anything. They had Jake, the snake, put the snake on him. And in triple H's defense, he never ran from it. He just laid there. They did everything they could do to him, embarrassed him and everything else, but he didn't quit. He stayed there and he took it. I will, I will say that for him. And he knew why they were treating him this way. It was, it was like a betrayal to Vince. So Vince was really teaching him a lesson, saying, we can control your career. We can make you look like a piece of crap. But... Triple H went with it and actually participated, actually got it over better. So, and I think after six months, they lifted the band and they started pushing him again. It's funny that Mark Mero probably has more wins over Triple H than anybody else in history. And he yeah, does. Probably. Mark Mero beat him every single night. Uh, I, talked to, I talked to Mark not long ago as well, and I'm, I think I said that to him. It's like, of all the people, you probably beat him like 120 times or something like yeah. that over the thingy. Uh, I'll finish out these last couple of things. There's one thing I want to bring up, and then uh, I'll just speed through the rest. He talks about brawl out uh, CM Punk with the, with Tony Khan, wide-eyed, nodding, basically agreeing with him. I think CM Punk said, this That's is the nothing scrum? Like the scrum, your favorite. Oh, God. He says that, um, <laughs> apart from the fact that we've both said this, press scrums in pro wrestling is stupid no because kidding. you because you basically just go out there you've 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 perpetrated three hours of a story or four hours of a story on a show and then you go out in front of you know filmed and just say well you know we work this and we work that and this is what we're going to be doing next and it's all yeah, it's, anyway uh, but the thing that pleased me the most is when he mentioned that uh, press scrums in pro wrestling are totally stupid as he said and then people in the audience asking the questions or a bunch of clowns with a few uh, with a few followers on Twitter getting credentials from AEW and some better known wrestling journals who also there who felt uh, who Tony Khan must have felt were pro AEW. And I can personally confirm that this is a fair comment because I know for a fact that uh, or I'm pretty sure I know for a fact anyway that Tony Khan was giving press credentials to people with like 200 Twitter followers and like no mm -hmm. listens to their podcast, essentially because they never said anything negative about AEW publicly, so therefore they were green lit. 
and that was that the, means that you couldn't go into a scrum. No, AEW, I, I couldn't either. No, it's because we've been honest. Well, isn't that like censorship? Sort of, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like censorship by omission. <laughs> yeah, censorship by not letting you show up. Yeah, but uh, uh, the, I've heard that there are internal. Uh, not even like bots or something like that. There are there, there are people out there who are either very pro AEW or who, who may even work for AEW, who search for people who make negative comments on AEW and then like bot them to death. I heard the same as, thing. Yeah, that kind of thing. But uh, and especially if you've ever said anything negative about AEW, like we have, and we're not saying it to be negative, we're saying it because we believe that's the truth. Then that's completely unacceptable. So yeah, it's a, it's a total. It's a total Soviet kind of uh, thing they've got Some, going on there. Somebody wrote me and it says, why don't you go to AEW and help them? You couldn't melt and pour me in AEW. Well, you could if you paid me enough money, but I, I think, I don't care how much money they paid you, I think it's too much of a headache. Because you're out there and trying to, you'd have to go in and, and do a complete hatchet job and you'd have to Clear, clear the decks and then restart. And that takes time. And I don't think they have that much patience. Plus, it's really being a booker, if it's all going good, you know, it's it's the creative team. Or no, it's the wrestlers making it good. But you got the same wrestlers when it's not doing good, but all of a sudden it's not them anymore. It's it's all creative. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, but but you when you do something enough. good, creative doesn't get the credit. And when it's doing bad, you know, you get all the, all the blame. Hmm. It's a, th it's a thankless job. It really is. Definitely. Uh, very quickly. NDA in place. We can't talk about brawling says he doesn't regret his time in AEW and he, and the positive that's out in that way, the negatives, he gives a shout out to MJF and said he did great stuff in AEW until he started pandering to the internet crowd. And then some mm -hmm. additional notes is guaranteed money is a problem in the business because it stops the wrestlers from striving to earn more money by drawing more. Uh, he said he considered a return to WWE a few years ago while doing the Fox Post show review shows. He mm -hmm. says his triceps uh, tear is healing far better than the first tear. He's very happy in WWE and doesn't now care if he doesn't headline a WrestleMania. But because it's now a two-day event, there's a better chance for him to do that. So that's pretty much the whole thing. And Dutch, on that note. We, we, oh, let me ask you this before we go. Okay. Will we see him at WrestleMania? Yeah, he's doing commentary for Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre on night two. Oh, so that's he, good. he should be present. Do you think that he will get make any kind of a – make his presence felt? so to speak? Well, I probably. I mean, why would you have him there otherwise? Well, he don't have to do nothing. He could just be there. On, I mean, not his presence spelled up, but I'm thinking with the Drew McIntyre. Yeah, well, it's not going to be like Mercedes and him, where and they just dump her out. Actually, he has he has a, a riff with uh, McIntyre and Seth Rollins, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a booker's dream. You could put him with anyone mm -hmm. in the upper echelons and it makes sense. You could put him with The could. Rock. You could put him with Cody. You could put him with Roman. You could put him with Drew. You could put him with Seth. You could put him with, I don't know, have a rematch. Okay, who would have thought that when we were talking about TKO and Endeavor taking over WWE and right when they took over, that's when it went, it exploded. Now, they could have done that with Vince there if he'd allowed it to happen. But Endeavor stepped back and let Triple H do it, and it took off. He said, like you said, it's red hot right now, but where they go, sales out. And it is a uh, an Attitude Era 2.0, especially if they do uh, the cursing, now the blood, and different shows. So and say the women are half naked anyway. 
so you don't well, need to do <laughs> the wrestle half naked, which is brilliant. Um, so you know you've got the the ticking off all three of the boxes: blood, swearing, half naked women. Let's do it. Jade Jade Cargill, you think she'll be a big, huge, big star? Bigger than an AEW, but I wonder if they're just going to like Goldberg her out and just like give her because that's what she did in AEW is she only did short matches because she wasn't capable of doing longer matches. And I'm wondering if it's going to be the same in WWE, but the fans are going to spot it quicker and then they're going to fall out with it quicker. Well, you got some eagle eye fan, eagle eyed fans out there. And if she does go longer, because she's 6'2", she's a big, big woman. So if she goes out there and goes five or six minutes, people are going to look at it like, hmm. And all she goes on is mystique and like secrecy. And that's, that's, that's the way she works. But if she has trouble going on TV and having a decent match in five or six minutes, you know, if she's built, if she's a, a, a two minute model, and then you take that away from her, you may be doing her more harm than good. And I hate to I hate to see him go out there and just all of a sudden, boom, the match is over. I don't they don't show me any of their any of their skills are. I, I, and she doesn't talk that well either. So they're taking a big chance on her, but I think she will have good matches um with Ray Ripley and Charlotte Flair. She'll have good matches with her. Even Bailey. Mm -hmm. I think Nia Jax. Now I think she'd need to get those two BMS at each other's throat. So I think you got it. So any more questions? No, that's gonna be it. It's midnight now here. Is it? And I'm yeah, I am tired. It's been one long day, let me tell you. So uh, what do I do at the end of these podcasts? Oh, oh one thing I'm going to mention is I don't think we're going to be doing an Ask Dutch Anything episode this week, owing to the fact that I'm away for so many days and I'm working solidly. Mm -hmm. So we will see you again regular time next Friday. I'll put an announcement out and just say for what it's for one week only. It's purely just because I'm away and it's just a bit difficult to do everything. And also, I forgot the damn password for the email question the question email thing. So I can't copy and paste from that either. So that's not helped. Uh, so <laughs> we'll figure it out anyway, but I, I'm pretty sure at this point, we're not doing an Ask Dutch Anything episode this week. So we're doing the regular show. That'll be out next Friday. There'll probably be no Ask Dutch Anything uh, this Tuesday, just for one week only, just because of uh, it's just, I'm just too busy. Okay. But for now, Dutch, uh, yeah, that's it. All the stuff, if you want stuff signed, go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com right there and, uh, for the books and everything. But for now, Dutch, we the people. We the people. I want to say one more thing. Oh, if, yeah. any, if anybody sees a homeless vet, this is what pisses me off. <clears throat> it's a little political. <laughs> we have immigrants come into this country, hadn't paid a hadn't paid a one dime in our tax. And we pay taxes, yet we have our veterans laying on the street, homeless, and nobody helps them. So we got to take it upon ourselves. So if you see a homeless vet, you got to spare a couple of dollars to give it to them because they, they, they've sacrificed a lot. So I think that they feel now and they can't be on the streets long before they, they just, they just die because it gets cold and then you just can't do it. Uh, but bless our vets and help them out if you can. But like you said, we, the people see you next week.